So here's the big question for you this morning. Ready? <laughs> what is most important to you? Okay, let me ask that again. Don't be too quick to answer. I want you to hold this thought in your mind. What is most important to you? Think about that. Ask God to tell you the truth. Let's just pause again. I know we just had a time of prayer, but you can't pray enough. I want us to pause right now and say, God, would you tell me the truth about me? Holy Spirit of God, would you speak to me through your word? Would you speak to me through the evidence of my own thoughts, the words that come out of my mouth, the way I use my time, the way I use my money? the way I relate to other people and what's important for me to talk about with other people? Lord, would you tell each of us the truth about what is most important to us? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There's a wonderful story in the scriptures. I want you to open up with me to John chapter 21, and we're going to look at the very last part of the Gospel of John. John 21, we're going to look at verses 15 to 22. This is, we're going to hear the last words of Jesus in the Gospel of John, okay? So, and I want you to reflect upon a question that Jesus asked Peter. A question that Jesus asked Peter is, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Okay, now let's enter into the dialogue, the exchange between Jesus and Peter. Remember, Peter's name was Simon. Jesus changed it to Petra, Rock, Peter. He said, upon you I'll build my church, upon his confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay, and so here we are at the very end of the Gospel of John. We're at the resurrected Jesus and Peter, who went back to fishing. <laughs> because he was so discouraged even after he knew the Lord had been resurrected so discouraged because things had not turned out the way he thought they should and he had not reacted and responded the way he thought he should so let's check this out John 21 uh, we're going to look at verses 15 to 22 and here's the exchange okay so when they had finished breakfast Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to Peter, tend my lambs. Jesus said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to Peter, Shepherd my sheep. Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of God, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. But Jesus continues. Don't stop there. Everyone likes to stop there. You got to keep going. Jesus said, tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grew old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this, he said, Jesus said, signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, this is so important, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. Wow. 
like I was saying, we usually cut this story short. Right at verse 17, we just chop it. Chop Jesus in mid-sentence. It's like, when, you know, when you're listening to someone you love and you don't even let them finish their sentence. That's what we do all the time in the church to Jesus' words in this story. It's just like, he's in mid-sentence and we jump right in with our response and we start teaching and we love this story because this is a story about Jesus forgiving Peter. It's a story about Jesus replacing the three denials of Peter with these three calls, these three times, do you love me? And we've taught that, and you've heard that. Okay, because what's happening here? Let me give you a little context. The context of this dialogue is a previous dialogue, and you can, if you want to turn there, you can. I'm just going to read it to you. It's from Luke 22. 31 to 34 this is the earlier exchange this is the context of this conversation and so when we go there it's let me get there luke what i say 22 31 to 34 check this out it's so important that you hear the backdrop here it is Simon, Simon, Jesus speaking. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I, Jesus saying this, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, hear this? When you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death boastful declarations that were not backed up by behavior. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, because Jesus knew. Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. So Peter, back in the John passage here, back at the very last passage of John 21, Peter is demoralized. He's discouraged. And he's probably feeling a bit of shame and self-condemnation. Okay? That's where Peter was at. He had gone back to fishing. Maybe he had forgotten the first call, follow me and I'll make you become fishers of men. Maybe he got a little bit of amnesia. Because sometimes when we get discouraged and we start feeling shame and condemnation, we forget the promises of God because we're wallowing in this place where we can't see clearly, where we can't see the way of God. We can't see the light because we're giving ourselves over to this emotion. And we start worshiping, almost like worshiping that emotion of shame and self-condemnation. And we feed it and we fill it with evidence. But Jesus... Jesus is doing something in Peter's life here. And it's so important. And I think we've missed it. I think it's key. I think we've misapplied the teaching. But I think this changes everything. So, we get back into John 21. And we look at the last verse, verse 22. The last words of Jesus in the Gospel of John that are repeated word for word in verse 23. This is what ends the conversation between Jesus and Peter. Ready? If I want John to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Wow. Jesus does not give you a job to do Jesus does not give you a comparison to make with another person Jesus invites you to have a relationship with him to follow him this revelation is not new this biblical insight is not revolutionary It's not new. But we have so quickly looked for a job to do that we have forgotten 
to do the most important thing, which is to be with the one who is the lover of our soul and to become like him. Oh. This is what is on the heart of God for his children. So I say to you, from the heart of God to repent and to return to your first love. Maybe you have fallen in love with knowledge of God. And in your pursuit of the knowledge of God, you have forgotten to love God for who he is. And I think that has been such a major issue that we fall in love with the study and the knowledge of God instead of just loving the God who loves us. We're so impressed with all that we know about God that we put aside knowing God. <sighs> Repent and return to the stewardship of your relationship with Jesus because that is what God established in the garden from the beginning. And that's what God is returning to us in the end. A stewardship of a relationship between God, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and his beautiful children, his family. You are his beloved child, son and daughter. And he so loves you that he gave his one and only son, that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. What does that mean? So you will not be cut off from the relationship with God, but that you will be embraced and welcomed back into the relationship with God. That is why Jesus came. He came to restore the family back to the headship of the Father, back to God's rightful rule, back to the love between a son and a daughter and their daddy. That's why he taught us to pray, Abba. Intimacy, relationship, the love story. And everything else in your life flows out of that relationship. Everything. A.W. Tozer said that the most important thing about you is, is how you see God. How do you see God? What is the most important thing? person relationship what's most important to you okay now let's go back to the john 21 text here i want to liberate my brothers and sisters who serve as church workers whether you're in paid staff or you volunteer doesn't matter you're a you're a, as a member of the the body of christ as a steward of the mysteries of grace, as the hands and feet of God, you are a worker, you are a servant of the king. So I want to liberate you here. In John 21, in this last section here, in this dialogue between Jesus and Peter, many a pastor and many a Christian worker <laughs> has lost their way because they cut the dialogue short. They stopped right after 10 my sheep in verse 17. I've heard this taught so many times. And rarely have I ever heard it taught in completion. Because we have forgotten, the church has forgotten, many a, many a hardworking, diligent churchgoer has forgotten that Jesus' first and last words to them is always follow me. Come to me. By the way, same Greek word for follow me and come to me. Jesus, from the beginning to the end of his earthly ministry, was calling his disciples into relationship. Christians, especially those diligent, serious ones, like Martha, <laughs> are worried and bothered about so many things. And we forsake the one thing that actually makes us a Christian. The only thing that actually makes us a Christian. And we do plenty of things in the name of Jesus. But are we spending time seeking the face of Jesus? Are we stewarding the relationship that God sent his son to restore to us? 
to redeem us into the Trinitarian fellowship of God's eternal embrace. Being baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Immersed in who He is because of the grace of God through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to have a life of belief, a life of faith? It is to so trust in this relationship that He changes your heart. He transforms you through the renewing of your mind. He gives you a new root system. He makes you into a new creation. And upon that branch, you bear great fruit. It's grace. Faith and faithfulness are both grace. It's all grace. It's all grace. So I had referenced that a lot of us are Marthas. And so I want to, for those of you who may not know the Bible, I want to show you that story real quick. Go to Luke 10, 41 to 42. Just real quick. In Luke 10, 41 to 42, we see the end of this story. Martha is busy getting everything ready, cooking the meal, doing all these things. Good hard worker. But the Lord answered Martha, because Martha had just said, Jesus, could you tell my sister Mary, who's just sitting there listening to you, to come help me? And Jesus says, Martha, 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 you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. (laughs) What was Mary doing? Mary was scandalously, yeah, she was being scandalous, being a stumbling block. She was scandalously causing Martha to stumble. (laughs) All right? Wow. How could it be possible that in the church, when people actually spend time investing in their relationship with Jesus as their first love, that it can cause other people in the church to feel like something's wrong with that person? I don't get that. Something's wrong with that. All right. Anyways, Mary was scandalously sitting at Jesus' feet, prioritizing Jesus and her relationship with him. Many a dutiful Christian knows that this story is supposed to be a good story, okay? It's kind of like the prodigal son and the older son story. We know that there's something going on here. We know Jesus is really getting to a point here, but we're kind of like, what's going on here? My emotions aren't really lining up with the story the way they should because I'm not really rooting for Mary in this story. I'm kind of rooting for Martha. Come on, Jesus. Come on. Come on, Jesus. Get on Martha's side here because she's the one getting the real work of the church done. Why won't Jesus just get on my side about this issue? Same thing in the prodigal son. Why can't he get on the side of the the older son? He was dutiful. He stayed home. He was a good boy. What was Jesus trying to communicate to us here? It's almost like he's trying to turn the world upside down or something like that. I'm going to ask you, what is most important to you? I've heard many a person over the years, churchgoers, great volunteers. I love these people. Not judging, just factual things here, not naming names. Not even saying it happened in this church. Just saying. I've heard people comment about this Mary Martha story and the prodigal son story from Luke 15, by the way. If you don't know where that is, Luke 15, 11 to 32. I don't have time to take you down that trail, too. That's, that's a sermon series. Uh, and I did it, so you can check out on our webpage. Like, we got a whole series on that. Anyways, I've heard people, churchgoers, great volunteers, comment that if we were all like Mary, then who would get the work done? And my answer is simple, okay? God gets the work done through us instead of us thinking we have to do the work for him. I wonder if we tried to christen our ambition. I wonder if we try to co-opt the Christian life that is for a kingdom not of this world into something that makes our lives work out for us well in this life. Hmm. I wonder if we've sold our birthright for a bowl of soup because we want things to work out well for us now. 
And because of that, I wonder if we are worried and bothered about so many things because we have forgotten that we're human beings, not human doings. That we are people made in the image of God. And that we will only find our joy, our completion, our happiness, our contentment in Christ. Not in our accomplishments, even if they're spiritual accomplishments. Oh, Lord, help us from those. Even if they're great achievements that build monuments to God. Because maybe the monument God's looking for is a broken and contrite heart. Because that will last. That will stand to the fires. Purify us, Lord. What is most important to us, Lord? Our primary job as followers of Jesus, if I can say it that way, because I'm, I'm an American speaking to an American, but I'm also a follower of Jesus grappling with a language to try to communicate to other people, trying to figure out how to use this language to communicate things about God that are hard to communicate. So stay with me. Our primary job is to follow Jesus by getting into his easy yoke, which we just sang about. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Rest is faith. Rest is trusting in the promises of God. Rest is believing in his sovereignty and that he's going to cause all things to work together for the good of lo those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Rest is not needing to be in control of everything because you believe God's already got it. Wow, maybe that could help with why we're so bothered and worried about so many things. Maybe if in that invitation we hear verse 29, because I stopped at verse 28, verse 29 says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Wow, what Jesus is inviting every follower to do, every image bearer to do, through his redemptive relationship, restoring you as an image bearer of God, is to be transformed, to be conformed, if you want to be biblical about it, because I know, to be conformed to the image of God, Romans 8, 29. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12. Okay, there's some strong scriptural passages here. The whole purpose of the yoke of the teachings of Jesus is to transform us to the renewing of our mind, to conform us to the image of Christ, which is gentle and humble in heart. And when you look at that, it's saying to be meek and submissive to the will of the Father, just like Jesus lived his life. Then you will find rest for your soul. It's grace. It's God at work in us. Are you able to rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ? Are you able to put aside your own incomplete works that we worry and get bothered about? Oh, I need to work today. I need to work another week without a day off because this is so important. And in the pride of that place, we continue to perpetuate this sense of, I can't trust God. I can only trust myself. And the arrogance of that place is the demonstration of our lack of faith. I'm not questioning your salvation. But when we're not experiencing the joy of our salvation, when we're not experiencing the, the, the commandments of God as light, then we've got to ask ourselves, who has become the most important thing in our life. Huh. Oh, man. Do you trust the sovereignty of God? Can you put aside the intellectual theological debates that come into your mind about sovereignty and can you simply find rest for your soul in the truth that God is over all and sees all? And because this is a Trinitarian Rest. Let's not forget that Jesus said, I'll never leave you as orphans. So he gives you the Holy Spirit. He gives you the Holy Spirit so that you can have an ongoing, unceasing fellowship with God. Sealed for the day. 
when that will be face to face. And until then, oh, to know that we're not left, we're not abandoned, we're not forsaken. Therefore, today, with these truths of God's love, I am calling you back. That's what repentance means. <laughs> I'm calling you back to the biblical priority of every believer's life, biblically. I'm not saying that might, that might not be your experiential truth, but I'm calling you back to line up your faith with your faithfulness, to line up what you say is true about the promises of God and how you practice your life. Because I want you to experience the abundance of God in John 10.10. 10. I want to experience the fullness of joy. I want you to experience the perfect peace of God that transcends all human understanding that will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I want you to experience the grace of God as your sufficiency for today. I want you to experience that his perfect love drives out fear. I want you to experience the truths of God, not just as doctrines, and as head knowledge, but as whole life experiences that this is a God who keeps his word. And when someone asks you the question, is God good? You can do more than a Baptist liturgical, God is good all the time, all the time God is good. You can give accounts of where you have seen God is good in your life. Because can you do that? Can you recall right now from the last week, can you pinpoint not just your faith that God is good, but can you see his faithfulness in your life that he has been good? Can you witness that? Can you narrate that? Because that is what's going to lead you to become a powerful evangelist, a powerful witness, is when his goodness is more than a declarative statement, but his goodness is a reality of your everyday life. I'm calling you back. I'm calling you to steward the relationship where you can taste of a love that is eternal and everlasting, that will never leave you nor forsake you, that will gird your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, that will build you upon the rock when everything else seems to be shifting around you. It's your relationship with God through the one mediator, Christ Jesus. That is the most precious gift that we should steward, that we can steward, that we've been invited to steward. And how do you do it? By getting in the yoke and walking with him, resting in the gift. So I'm calling you back. I'm going to use the words of Paul to do it. We're going to go to Romans. <laughs> Romans 12. I want, to, I want you to hear. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore. What's the therefore? What's the therefore, therefore? It's therefore because if you believe everything from Romans 1.1 1, 1 to the end of Romans 11, therefore, by the mercies of God, by all these truths about the gospel, therefore, now is what, this is what you do. Here's the imperative, the command, that follows all the indicatives, all the truths of Paul's um, treatise on the gospel. So hey, let's look at this. Romans 12, 1 through 8. Please stay with me. This, this, this is so important. Hear these words. First, in verse 1, I appeal to you, brothers, and, and it's sisters too. It's talking about the brethren. It's talking about the family of God here, Okay. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Every member of God's family is invited to be, and hear this phrase, absolutely dependent. Absolutely dependent on God. God is inviting you to respond to the grace by the mercies of the gospel by becoming absolutely dependent on him. Where am I getting that phrase? Well, a sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. To put yourself on the altar, willingly, faithfully, daily. This is the only way for his body, the church, to function with only one rightful authority under the headship of Jesus Christ. This is the posture of every family members because we're a family. We're not an institution. We're a family. That's how God sees us. I know how the world sees us. I hear all the talk. But my job, my calling, this is to not speak on behalf of the world to you, but to speak on behalf of God to you through his word, not my opinions, 
but through the word. You see, what Paul is doing here is he's calling us back to our first love. He's calling us back to the priority of a heart and mind that are submitted to Jesus Christ. A 19th century pastor, that means a guy who died a long time ago, he wrote this, absolute dependence upon God is the secret of all power and work. The branch, and this is, he's using the vine imagery from John 15, so if you don't know that, John 15, 1 through 16, you can check it out. The branch has nothing but what it gets from the vine, and you and I can have nothing but what we get from Jesus. Amen. Amen. In a world gone haywire, we need to return to this kind of view that we can do nothing apart from him. And that's neither a postmodern nor a modern worldview. That's a biblical worldview. That's what Jesus said, and I take him at his word. I can do nothing apart from him. I need to be absolutely dependent upon him. And then we look at verse 2. Verse 2 of Romans 12 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Beautiful. We have taught, I've taught a whole series of messages on this. This is so important. Do not be conformed. Do not be distracted. And so what is Paul telling us here? <laughs> Simply this. Same thing the Apostle John told us in his last words in his first letter, uh, first epistle of John. Little children, do not give yourself to idols. <laughs> Paul's calm, calling us to eliminate false worship. He's calling us to eliminate competing distractions from our lives. What's most important to you? And I just wonder if God maybe is showing you some things by thinking about that question, some things that need to be put in right order possibly some things that might need to be eliminated from your life apart from this apart from our complete absolute dependence upon God as with Jesus as the head of this church of the congregation of the body of Christ and apart from us being able to eliminate the competing distractions and the false worship that happen in every human heart the church, the congregation, the family of God, the body of Christ cannot work in unity. Because when God's family members are chasing after their own heart's desires, instead of seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness and trusting that he will add all these things unto us, then it just tears the body. It's like this. I often teach you this. And so let's bring it home. Application, right? Application home, where, where, where we feel it in our relationships. Whether you're in a marital relationship, whether you have an important relationship of your life, whether you have family, parents, children, whatever. Whatever your situation, here's some truth. Your relationships are more about your holiness than your happiness. Your relationships are more about your sanctification than your satis satisfaction. Your relationships are more about your godliness than your own goals. If you try to use people to make yourself happy, to have your needs met, you'll, ne you'll never be, you'll neither be happy nor holy. But if you seek first Christ-likeness, if you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, if you seek first to be in that yoke with Jesus and to be being conformed to him, being gentle and humble heart, and then that will inform all of your other relationships. And out of that place, blessed you will be. Happy. Holy. Because he will be your all in all. And he will be the one that informs how you handle all those circumstances and all those relationships and all those tricky situations that when left to your own autonomic nervous system, your fight or flight syndrome, when left to your own, you know, common sense principles of how to handle people, you're not going to forgive 70 times 7. You're not going to turn the other cheek. The only way you do those things is if you've been conformed to the image of Christ. And I want to say this. 
you can enjoy the best that this world has to offer because God designed this world for you to enjoy the best of what he's created for humanity. The problem is it's been so distorted. Our hearts have become so perverted. So I want to call you to seek first and desire that which God desires for you. I want you to turn with me. I'm just going to read this with no comments. Yes, I can do that. Romans chapter 1, verses 25 to 32. You can enjoy the best this world has to offer because God has created it for us to enjoy. But let us not become like these people who stop seeking after God first and start seeking after all the things that this creation has to offer. So Romans 1, 25 to 32. I'm not going to add or take away anything from this text. This is the word of God. May he speak to you. I'm going to start in verse... I'm going to start where I said, verse 25. Verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Jesus has established that the world will know those who are following him and him alone. His word has made it clear. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. A bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Those who follow Jesus will walk in oneness with him. Just like Jesus walked in oneness with his own father. Paul knew this, and he called every follower of Jesus to respond to the grace of God. Because none of this is possible apart from the grace of God. Both your faith and that brings about your salvation and your, and your faithfulness that declares to the world your salvation. Both your faith and your faithfulness are gifts of God through the work of the Trinity. <clears throat> and so Paul ends his call to repentance in Romans 12 with these words in verses 3 to 8. So back to Romans 12. Hear these words. So first, you have to be absolutely dependent upon the headship of God, the sovereignty of God, headship of Jesus. And then you have to eliminate those competing distractions that cause you to chase after all those things in the world where you're you're seeking after the creation rather than the creator for your pleasures (laughs) so we don't end up like Romans 1. And now, hear the next step. Here it is. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober, the word is sincere, it means not to be intoxicated, 
Um, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And just a comment about that word about not being intoxicated. It's not actually talking about any kind of alcohol or drug right there. It's talking about your view of yourself intoxicating you to live your life in a way that is not in alignment with God's mercies and God's grace. Having a distorted view of yourself. And I would say if you have a distorted view of God, you will automatically have a distorted view of yourself because how can you know who you are apart from God? Because he designed you to reflect him. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. That is our calling. To let flow out of this what God has produced in us. We are called to be absolutely dependent on God and mutually dependent on one another. And the only way this happens is humbly seeing ourselves according to the measure of faith that God has given us. If we are to see ourselves outside of the filter of grace and mercy, there is a good chance we have a distorted view of ourselves because we are not understanding the sovereign grace of God. We are God's family. And when God's family is at our best, we look like one mature man, one mature person, according to Ephesians 4, 11 to 16. When the body of Christ, when the church is at its best, we look like one body, one mature person reflecting God. And what does that practically look like? When people see us, they see Jesus walking through the community, which is why our vision statement, which we have been so living, trying to live up to, is about bringing thriving to the glory of God. Because when the members of the body are awakened to the spiritual truths of God's word, then the Holy Spirit will cause you, through a life of belief, to reflect God and we together will look like Jesus. <laughs> humility does not cause you to use less of what God has given you. Rather, humility is using all that God has given us in cooperation with one another as fellow members of the one body of Christ, as brothers and sisters adopted to the King of Kings. He causes us to use everything we have and bring all that we have to the table without need. Humility causes us not to have a need for credit. Not having a need for recognition. So that the world would see one mature person, Jesus, the only one worthy of seeing. Because I can't save anybody. it's no longer about me or you getting our needs met from one another or other people. Church, I love you, but you can't meet my needs. The church having an empty parking lot or the church having a full parking lot can't make me feel any better or worse about myself because I find my completion in Jesus. How someone treats me or what they say about me in Christ, I am secure. And that gives me stability to live faithfully without being pulled to the left or to the right. No matter what may come, though he may slay me, blessed be his name. For he is faithful and he is good. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit in me and that is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. That is faith. That is faithfulness. <coughs> that is a, that's everything coming together so that we're one mature body. And that's how we respond to the plan of God. And I'm going to end with this thought. When the world sees you, they see what you reflect. The plan of God is for you to be the image bearer of God. The plan of God is for you to reflect the love and the care and the stewardship of God for the creation that he created, for his delight. <laughs> and what the world sees is the God you reflect. 
That's the way God designed it. So my question is, what are you reflecting? Because that's what tells us who your God is. And your God is always what is most important to you. That's why it's so important for us to realize that Jesus' conversation with Peter did not end with a job description. Jesus' first and last words to his disciple in which he would build his church was an invitation to an intimate relationship with him that would change him from the inside out. And he said to Peter, who was distraught and depressed because he had messed it up. I can relate. I've been a public failure. I know what it is to feel shame and condemnation and want to run away. But I heard what Peter heard. Don't worry about them. You, follow me. You, follow Jesus. What's most important? Lord Jesus, you are my all in all. I have known self-condemnation. I have known shame. But greater than any temptation, greater than any emotion, greater than any public opinion poll, I have heard the words of Jesus come to me. You. Yeah, I see your weariness. I see your brokenness. I see how hard you tried to make it all work. You, stop. Stop that. Come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my life, my learnings upon yourself. Learn from me. Learn from me. And you'll find rest. You'll find faith you'll find faithfulness. Jesus, that is my prayer for every member of this congregation, for every person within the sound of my voice, and for every person who is hearing the invitation of Jesus. My prayer is that you would respond to the grace of God and submit your life so that you are absolutely, 100%, completely dependent upon God for your daily bread for your forgiveness for your relationships for your job choices may you respond to the mercy of God in Jesus name Amen